So let's keep going. So shrink, expand. Wax kind of does both, so I left that blank, I think. Investment expands, and our metal shrinks upon cooling. All right, so the next step after um, making an impression is to turn the impression into stone and to put it on an instrument that simulates the movement of the mouth. So tomorrow we're going to talk about um, the articulator. So if you guys can, bring those in, your articulators. And how many of you still have your cast from when you did your waxing exercise from D1 year? Okay. So I think we have enough. So why don't you guys bring that in too, just so we can have something that's mounted and we can kind of take a look at the different movements. If you don't have yours, that's, that'll be okay. We can, we can share it with something that's sitting next to you. But the idea is we have enough of those laying around that we can all visualize um, some of the movements. All right, so some of the questions we're going to ask is what type of stone should the cast be made out of? Uh, how do we want to mount our cast in the articulator? How can we best simulate the movements of the jaw? That will be tomorrow. And what are the different types of articulators? So they go from real simple, just a simple hinge, to what we call a fully adjustable articulator that's got a ton of little knobs and little uh, settings that we can set it to. So the first question is, what material should the impression be poured into or poured in? So we know that's going to be gypsum. You guys have done this before. Um, but the question is, what type of gypsum? So before we get into that, let's get into a little bit of the chemistry. This is sort of um, not the most exciting thing. But we'll simplify it, right? You have powder. You have water. And you just kind of mix it up. At the end, you get stone, and it gives us a little heat, right? So if you want to put it in more technical terms, we start with a hemihydrate, you add water, and then you get dihydrate with some unreacted hemihydrate, and you get heat. If you want to see the chemical formula, this is what we have. Okay, powder, water, gives you stone, and heat. So how does this all come about? So this is what you should have learned in your dental materials class, but we'll review it today. So we'll go to the Four steps are pretty simple. First step, well, you mix it with water and you get a suspension that is fluid and workable. Okay, step two, the hemihydrate dissolves until it forms a supersaturated solution. So once you have a supersaturated solution, we jump to step three, and it precipitates out dihydrate. So as step four, as the dihydrate precipitates, the solution is no longer saturated with the hemihydrate, so it can use, continues to dissolve, right? So dissolution of the hemihydrate and precipitation of the dihydrate proceeds as either new crystals form or further growth occurs on the crystals already present. The reaction is continuous and continues until no further dihydrate precipitates out of solution. Okay. So really, this is the part we want you guys to kind of focus on. Um, dissolution of the hemihydrate precipitates out as either new crystals form or further growth occurs on crystals already present. So you have these sites of nucleation and things just kind of latch on and it just grows and grows as it crystallizes. All right. So what happens when you use slurry water? So slurry water, if you go to your uh, the wet lab back there, uh, next to the or in the grinder, they got a little tube, right? As you turn it on, you got water that flows down into like a little bucket. So there's a little water that collects there and it's a little slurry or cloudy, right? So if we use that water and mix it in with our uh, plaster, what happens is your set time of that material increases pretty rapidly. So if you wanted to have your stone set much more quickly, you can use this a little bit of slurry water. So how does the slurry water help us? So let's go back to point four, right? The whole idea of this gypsum is that you have these crystals that form, and those act as sites of nucleation, and um, they keep growing until the reaction, there's no further dihydrate. So the idea of the slurry water is already in that slurry water, you have little sites of nucleation because you have previously ground gypsum that act as you know sites of uh, for crystals to grow in, so that's the whole idea. Um, and I was at the Whitmix headquarters where, where they make a lot of this stone, 
and I asked them um, about dimensional change of this material if we use uh, slurry water, because you would think, okay, does that affect powder water ratio, all these things. Uh, and from their studies, they said, I don't think it's published, but what they've done internally is that if you use slurry water, there's actually negligible kind of change in the material. Um, so in theory, you can use a little slurry water if you want things to kind of set a little quicker. But I think that helps kind of understand this kind of dissolution precipitation theory, that if you add more sites to gliation, then the whole idea is that this thing is precipitating out, and then it'll set a little quicker. Okay, so if you're ever in a little rush, we have this thing called snapstone that um, has a quick set. But if you want to use the microstone that we have, <clears throat> you can add a little slurry water uh, to accelerate the set. Yeah. I'm sorry. It um, decreases the set time, meaning it sets faster. So it, yeah, I don't know why I said that, but yeah. Set time is better, I guess. And by better, I mean faster. Good call. It's just not working out for me today. OK, how is gypsum classified? So the only gypsum you guys have used is um, um, the microstone. So it's categorized in five types. One through five. So on the left, you can see one through five. The part I want you to pay attention to is that middle column where it says compressive strength. So as you go from one to five, it goes from weaker to stronger. So five is your high strength. One, think of it as very weak. So your mounting plaster, the white stuff that you've used, that's pretty weak, right? You can get in there and it kind of flakes off sometimes. Um, so you got to remember one through five. Five is higher strength. One is lower strength. And then we'll get into the difference of type four and five in a second. So the micro stone you use, we'll call that dental stone. That's your type three. That's your yellow stone that we have in the lab. Okay, so to simplify it, type one, we got our plasters. And don't worry about the stuff in front of the plaster part, because some they'll call it like uh, ortho plaster or mounting plaster or impression plaster. Um, so a lot of times it'll be named sort of by its indication and what they use it for. Uh, but the idea is type one and two is plaster. And let's get into the uh, difference between the plaster and the stone. Okay, so on one side we have a beta hemihydrate. They're large particles and they're irregularly shaped. On the right, we have alpha hemihydrate. They are small particles, and they're more prism and rod-like shape. Okay. So out of the two, which do you think is going to have more compressive strength, A or B and Y? So we'll give you the answer because it's in your PowerPoint. So stone is your more smaller particles, your alpha hemihydrate. So that's types one through uh, three f through five. And then plaster is your weaker one, and that's your beta hemihydrate. So they're more irregularly shaped. So if you got irregularly shaped versus kind of smaller particles, which would be stronger? The smaller, and why is that? Yeah, you can pack it a little bit more densely because you know, they're more regularly shaped, right? Okay, so that's one way to remember it. Plaster type one and two, they got large irregularly shaped, so you can't pack it in as much, and you're gonna have a weaker stone, whereas your type three to five will have um, small particles that are prism rod shaped that can pack in a little bit more densely. So here's just a little chart, and let's go through some of these uh, principles of water to powder ratio and the effect that it has. So if you add a little bit more water, what do you think it does to the setting time? It takes longer to set, right? So what do you think it does to the strength if you add more water to it? it makes it weaker because now your crystals or you know, your particles are further apart because you've got more water in your uh, it, dispersed within that material a little bit more, right? 
How about setting expansion? Increase. And why do you say increase? Because, okay, so you said the setting time is longer, so there's more time for expansion. Anybody else? Ashley? Increase volume? Okay. So do you increase volume just because you add a little bit more water? So, you know, things are bigger, right? So it's true. So let's clarify this point. If you add more water, let's say you got a pack in a microstone, right? And you add more water, your volume is going to be bigger because you've added more water, right? But if you looked at the percent of uh, expansion, which do you think will be bigger? So your percent of expansion actually decreases as you add more water. So think of it this way. As your crystals kind of grow, if you add more water, there's more space between your crystals. So they don't push against each other as much. So there's more spacing between you guys. You're not pushing against your neighboring crystal and expanding the stone. Okay? So the more water you got, the percent of expansion kind of decreases. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, question. Okay. So as you add more, so you got one packet of microstone. Let's say you have two packets of microstone. One, you use the exact the amount of water specified by the um, uh, manufacturer. And the other one, you added, let's say, 10 milliliters of water. Right. So in the one that you added 10 extra um, uh, mils of water, you're going to have more stuff because there's more water. Right. But if you actually measure the percent in which that has expanded during the setting uh, reaction, that percentage is lower than your um, the one that you mix to the proper ratio. Um, say again? Because it's out of the higher total volume, if it's diluted? Yeah, you can think of it as it's diluted so the uh, crystals are further apart from each other. So they don't push as much. So maybe, maybe money makes a little bit more sense, OK? So let's say you had $100, right? And you had a 5% interest rate, right? So your return on that's going to be $5, right? OK. So let's say you added, let's say you had $200 in sales. So you doubled the amount of money, right, that you put in, but your interest rate is only 2%. So how much money would you have or where would you have more money? The second scenario. You put $200 in, right? So you've kind of made more money in that sense. But your rate of return is a lot less. Does that make sense? No? All right, man. <laughs> Teaching economics, man. You guys, you, how much student loan do you guys have? You just got to figure this stuff out. All right, next lecture we'll have a how to manage your money kind of deal. All right, we are we are in trouble. Because what are you guys walking out of here? 400K? Is that about right? After interest? All right. Maybe we'll do a lunch and learn on, like, your loan forgiveness programs and all that. So we'll set that up for you guys. All right, we'll, we'll revisit this if people are confused. But I don't want to spend too much more time on it. All right, so this should look somewhat <coughs> familiar. Plaster, the one that we use in the clinic, is a type 1. It's a, what they call a mounting or an impression plaster. There's different names for it. Okay, type 1 plaster. And then your stone or micro stone, that yellow stone, is a type 3. So it's right smack in the middle. Then we have type 4 and 5, which are high strength, low expansion. So for our, think, um, this is what I want you to remember. For our diagnostic cast, so when your patient first comes in the clinic, we want you to make impressions on the patient so you can mount it on an articulator and then you can treatment plan with, you know, one of the faculty here. So for our diagnostic impressions, we want you to use the type 3 stone. One reason is it's a lot cheaper. 
right? And we're not actually making any prosthesis off of this type three stone. We just need it to, you know, when the patient's gone, we can look and see how the teeth look. You know, the x-ray only gives us so much information. When we have mounted casts, uh, we call them diagnostic casts. We can evaluate, um, um, you know, the case and treatment plan. So type three stone for diagnostic casts. The other time you want to use a type three stone, the microstone, is when you make dentures. And you'll learn about this in your complete denture class, I think come January or maybe December. But type three microstone for dentures. And then for any crown and bridge, you're gonna use a type four or five stone. And we'll jump into the why. So why is type three gypsum used for dentures and type four and five for crowns? So um, what you wanna think about is type three is weaker. So I don't need you guys to remember or memorize this, but just for your understanding for today. When you make a denture, in order, after you've kind of finished making the denture, you gotta, uh, what we call break, uh, recover the denture after it's been processed, okay? It's gonna be all foreign to you, but the idea is that you actually gotta break your stone cast, your final impression for your denture, out. You have to break the stone in order to kind of recover your denture after it's been processed. So that process of breaking the stone is much easier if it's in a weaker type three stone. So just think of it that way. When you finish your denture, the lab step requires us to break the cast in order to recover the denture. Therefore, it's better to use a weaker stone, a type three stone for dentures. Whereas if you wanna do something for crown and bridge, you want a harder stone because you don't want that stone to abrade as you're working on it during all, remember all the steps that we have to fabricate this, um, this crown? We're trying things on and off, on and off. We're checking the contacts. All that abrades the stone, so you want something that is harder. So again, this is all based on our classification, which one way to classify is by the strength. And then we still got to differentiate between type four and five because they're the same strength. So the difference between type four and five is the amount of expansion, okay? So we're gonna call type five a high, ex high strength, high expansion stone. So remember in the beginning we talked about having to compensate for everything, all the expansion and shrinkage. So we're gonna to touch upon this a little bit later in the class, but we have this idea of um, high noble, noble, and base metal alloys. So the type of metal that we use to fabricate these crowns. So the low end is what we're gonna call a base metal, and that metal tends to shrink a lot more. The advantage of the base metal is it's a lot cheaper, okay? Significantly cheaper than <coughs> your gold containing alloys. So if you got a metal, if you're using a metal that's got higher shrinkage, well to compensate for that, you want a die that's a little bit bigger. So you wanna use a type five, high strength, high expansion gypsum in order to compensate for the amount of shrinkage or the higher shrinkage of base metals. Clear? So this is what we use in our school clinic. Our type four high strength die stone. So the brand name we use is Excalibur. Okay, and it comes in different colors. So you want different colors. Um, the, the idea is as you paint like your die spacer and you have your wax, <coughs> you want those different colors so you can differentiate between different layers. So I said it comes in all these different colors. But you can see the information about set time, 12 to 15 minutes, water powder ratio, and compressive strength, the amount of expansion. So 0.09% um, expansion. So not a lot, but a little bit. Okay, so why should a cast be soaked in water before trimming? So this is more kind of a practical thing. Um, just remember the wet, strength of the stone is a lot weaker than the dry strength. So as you soak it in water, 
it's a little bit weaker, so it just makes it easier to trim. The other reason is because as you grind, you'll find that a lot of the little particles accumulate on your stone, and they kind of get stuck on your stone, and then they don't kind of rinse off as easily. So always after you trim, run it under some water to kind of get rid of all the particles, because the last thing you want is to bring in casts that have all these little loose particles on there, and then you bring it into somebody's office to treatment plan. Now I got stone particles all over my desk. Okay, so don't want that. So wet strength is weaker than dry strength. Therefore, soak it. Probably only soak it for a couple minutes before you start trimming. Okay, so we talked about the um, removable die system. Remember we showed where we can take on and off the die? So what do we say was one of the advantages of that? So if we want to take the die out and then kind of wax it up, we can kind of spin that thing. We can get to all areas of that die to do our wax up. So as we're carving, you know, you don't have the teeth in the way, the interproximal, the adjacent teeth uh, in the way so that you can sneak all your instruments in those little kind of corners, okay? And then you can always put it back on um, to check your contacts when you do your wax up. You guys need a little refresher on this? Should we pull up the video? Yeah. Removable die system. Remember we passed around the little cast that you're able to separate the die? Okay. So that's one of the advantages. It just makes it easier for us to fabricate um, the crown. Um, but the disadvantage to that is, remember we got moving parts to it. So remember we kind of put the pin in, then we have the little sleeves, and then you're taking this on and off. Well, if you think about, if there's a little bit of movement between each of the parts, um, you can have some minor discrepancies. You know, think of your interproximal contacts. Remember the criteria that we have for interproximal contacts is that we want to be able to get floss to pass through. So now imagine putting that die back on your removable die system and there's a little bit of movement between the two. And now your interproximal contacts may not be as accurate as you had intended it to um, because instead of one solid piece, you have it in kind of three separate pieces. So at some point, they're going to suction this, right? So they pour the base layer. So now it's going to be in three pieces here. So as that goes back on, I mean, it's pretty accurate. It doesn't move a lot, but there's a little bit of that micro movement um, that can affect your interproximal contacts, okay? So the other thing, too, is this becomes your working die in the sense that, remember all the little adjustments that we'll do where we kind of check or adjust the contacts? Well, each time you take something on and off and it rubs against the neighboring adjacent tooth, it kind of scrapes the stone a little bit, okay? So over time, that becomes less accurate. Um, so the way around that, if we're going to use this system, um, we're going to ask the lab, and the lab kind of does this routinely, they pour up a solid, let's see if that's the next slide. So why does this lab send back a solid model? And let's see if I brought it. My solid model here. Okay, so this is an example of a prep that hasn't been um, trimmed, and I'll pass this around. But the idea is that after you've poured it the first time, you're going to pour 
a second solid model that you don't touch until the crown's fabricated. You take your crown and then you try to fit it back onto this solid model that is, in theory, not blemished. So you have a better way to test your interproximal contacts. So that is why we have the lab send back a solid model for in, <coughs> to verify seeding of our interproximal contacts. All right, so how do we mount the two arches against each other? Uh, there's different kind of verbiage for this. Some people call it the kind of more technical term, a maxillomandibular jaw relation record. We've also called it a jaw relation record. Or some people call it a bite or a bite registration. So all those things call it, kind of all amount to the same thing as how do the upper and lower jaw fit together? So the whole idea is you want to design a crown so that it's in the proper occlusal context. You want those, um, you want to have minimal adjustments as you seat the crown. Uh, when they bite down, you want that to be comfortable. You don't want it to be in hyper or hypo occlusion. So if it's a stable maximum intercuspation position, it is possible to hand articulate the cast together. So here's the idea. If we took um, your, let's say your Taipidon was a real person, right? And you needed, they needed a crown on number three. And then you prepped number three. Let's say you did it yesterday. And you did a great job at it. And then you made a final impression. And then you took a final impression. You made a final impression of the opposing. And then you got two casts back. So pretend these are in die stone, type 4 die stone. In order to relate the two together, since we've only prepped one cast, what can we do? We can just kind of hold it together like this and hand articulate. So if you got a stable maximum intercuspation, meaning all your cusp tips interdigitate very well with the appropriate fossa, then you can just hold it together, and that's an accurate representation of how they close together, right? So if there's only one way those two things fit together, you have a stable maximum intercuspation. And then when we go to mount, maybe we'll let's pull up the mounting video real quick, um, and it becomes a fairly simple procedure where we can just um, hand articulate the two together. So mounting master cast. Any questions concerning that? So let's skip this part. So we'll talk about this part tomorrow where we're going to assume we have the upper cast mounted already. So you see how I'm just holding the two arches together? And then I'm kind of using um, some, it's called a compound or it's sort of like a wax. Or just kind of using some something real rigid like a metal rod or a tongue depressor to kind of hold those together. Okay. So we're going to hand articulate those because we have a stable maximum intercuspation. There's no rock to it. Then that's how we mount the lower to our articulator. And we'll cover the upper tomorrow. Okay. Um, let me, let's see how many more slides we got. Okay, a couple more slides and then we'll take a little break, okay? So let's say we have this situation. Let's say a patient is edentulous. So on this cast, this patient is edentulous from 18, 19, and 20. This might work. Let's try this out. 
So what do you what do you think is going to happen if we try to? Okay, so number seventeen is prepped for a crown. I don't know if you can see that. So what do you think is going to happen if we try to hand articulate this together? It's not going to work because we don't have a tripod essentially, right? This side back here can rock back and forth, right? So that's not good because we're not going to know how to mount the two casts together, correct? Okay, so what's the way in which we can get around? We know in the mouth they close down and it stops somewhere. We don't know what this distance is if we just have the two casts. So what's the way in which we can capture this distance? A temporary. Okay. This is what we're going to teach you. We're going to take what we call this bite registration material. This is um, a polyvinyl siloxane that sets very quickly. Okay. So why don't you do this? Do you want to squirt or do you want to hold? You want to hold? Okay. So pretend this is a patient and we're going to ask them to close together. Okay. What you're going to do as the operator, so just kind of, why don't you stand over there and just kind of simulate this. Okay. Let's practice a couple times. Okay, and make sure we got little. So when they close, you're going to have some space there, right? Okay. So what's going to happen is, as the operator, I'm going to take some of this bite registration. I'm going to squirt some just over the prepared tooth, and I want enough so that when they close together, like that, it touches the opposing tooth. Okay. So that acts as my measurement for the amount of space. That's between the upper tooth and the prepared tooth. So this takes about 30 seconds to set. And what you'll have is your prep cast, your opposing cast, and then this bite registration that's going to serve to help stabilize your cast. Question. Yeah, so we got contact everywhere. But we don't have a tripod, right? So this kind of, right? So, um, yeah, we have enough contact on the other side where if we add this, it'll stabilize. Thank you. So this is our bite registration. And you can see that this one side is our preparation. And on this side is, you can see the indents of the cusps. Okay? So that fits on there. So imagine these are casts now. And now we can set this together. And now we have a stable tripod, and we have the exact distance from the prep to the opposing. Okay? So we have to have a bite registration in cases where you can't get things to be stable. Okay? Um, in the first scenario, the bite registration helps. <coughs> because it helps verify that we have the right mounting. But in theory, if you forgot to do it, you can still hand articulate, and you're pretty confident that that is the proper maxillomandibular jaw relation, jaw relationship, right? So here at the school, what we're going to ask you to do is just get a bite registration for every case that you'll do, you know, just in case we find that it's not stable or we want to help verify. Some cases it's really critical, like this one here. And then some it just helps to verify that we've kind of done it correctly. But in theory, the first kind of scenario where we can hand articulate, you don't technically kind of need it. And we only need it from the prep tooth to the opposing tooth. You don't want any of that material to leak over to kind of adjacent teeth where teeth are kind of touching. Okay. And then... Um, so we'll, we'll kind of into that a little bit later as to why we just want it between the two teeth. Okay. So we have a couple different uh, registration materials. Um, and we'll, oh, let me go through this one example real quick. Here's another example, right? So this patient has all their teeth. So in theory, you would think, okay, that's pretty stable, right? So the patient's got all their teeth, and we should be able to do this. 
But as you look at her dentition, what do you notice about it? She's worn herself really flat. So she actually doesn't have great cuss to fossa relationship, right? Everything's ground flat. So if you take the two casts and you try to hand articulate, what do you think would happen? Well, it can slide laterally quite a bit. So the question is, well, what is her actual bite? So that's a little bit harder to kind of tell. So just because they have all their teeth and you would think that they have a tripod, doesn't always make for what we, you know, make for this case to be able to be hand articulated. So there are cases where patients have all their teeth, but you would have to have a bite registration in order to mount the case together. Is that clear? Okay, let me finish this <coughs> with this. Just want to introduce a couple materials to you. We have a take one, which is extremely rigid. It's uh, a fast set. I think it's only about 30 seconds. And then the color is green. We also have Regisil, which is less rigid, which gives us more work time. So this working time is 45 seconds compared to working time of 15 seconds. So when you guys ever, whenever you guys use a material, um, we want you to know some of these um, timing, and you, you got to know the properties of the material that we're using. Um, so I'm going to squirt a little bit of this purple, and we'll pass this around, and you can see the difference in the rigidity of the two materials, um, so you can appreciate where one is a lot faster working time, or really the rigidity of the two materials. Um, you won't appreciate the setting time until you kind of actually use it for yourself. So when we get back from break, we'll pass this around. Question? So you add up the working time and the setting time. So it's like take one and 30 seconds. Yeah. 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 Right, right, okay. So the setting time is, okay, so here, working time, 45 seconds and the mouth removal time, which is our setting time, that's a minute 30. Those are all measured from the time that you start mixing. Okay, so it's not additive on top of each other. So total, uh, total time and setting time, including working time. Yeah, right, right. So all that is measured from the time of mix, question. Why would you want Okay, right. So sometimes you're working cross arch and you got multiple areas, and then sometimes you gotta manipulate their jaw into the full closure all the same time. So there's cases where, man, you kind of need more time to work. You know, 15 seconds may not be enough for you to have uh, an undistorted kind of material. So we have a couple different materials for you to work with. So let's, let's write down these times, just so you guys can remember them. Uh, take one, set uh, working time is 15 seconds. The total set time is a minute. Regisil, this is 45 seconds working time. Mouth removal time, a minute 30. And then you should also know the same setting and working time for your PBS materials. So again, anything you're gonna put in the patient's mouth, I want you to have a good understanding of all the properties and then all the timing of it. Question? Yes. So by registration, if you're preparing a crown, should be over the prepared tooth and then it should touch the opposing tooth or teeth. Okay, so just in that area to help stabilize. I don't want it leaking over to the adjacent teeth that are actually in contact. So let's talk about this wax up. So we want to add wax until it looks like a tooth. So that part is pretty straightforward, hopefully. So why do we need to mark the margin? Remember in that video, we, he draws the margin with a red line, so it's easy to identify the margin. Because we're gonna add wax to it, and we wanna see exactly where you should finish the wax to. Okay, you don't want wax to leak over the margin, otherwise you have an overhang. And then if you have wax that's short of that margin, then you have an open margin. Um, so we want either of those things. So what's the purpose of die spacer? You saw Joey paint that little red kind of nail polish-like stuff on there. So what do you think the purpose of the die spacer is? Well, it's to make room for the cement. 
So if you made a crown that perfectly fits the tooth, well, you got to cement it in with something. And that cement has a minimum film thickness. So you've got to make a little room for that. Otherwise, this crown won't go down all the way because the cement takes up um, some space. Okay? So a little bit about die spacer. Um, and this is, just think of this as another variable in which the lab can control. Because remember we talked about shrinkage and expansion and all that and getting everything to kind of work. Well, die spacer is one of those things that you can vary um, depending on all the different factors. And I think each lab has their own system in which, um, you know, how many layers they like to put on, okay? And then what, and each layer you can buy die spacer of different thicknesses too. So some studies will say 25 to 40 microns of space is recommended. Um, it comes in various thicknesses. And the factors that can influence the amount of relief that you want to put in is the type of cement that you're going to use. So if you have a real thin film thickness, you probably don't need as much. If you have using a different type of cement that is a thicker film thickness, um, you may want to take that into consideration. Okay? So we'll learn about cements um, probably after our little break in October when we cement in our gold crowns that we make. And then total occlusal convergence. So how do you think that influences the amount of dice space that we need? So if you have real parallel walls, right, it's going to be harder to seat that because there's less room for that cement to kind of escape out of. So you want a little bit more relief, so you got a little bit more room for that cement to kind of leak out. Whereas if you have a real taper, as you seat it, as you're driving that crown down, well, the walls of the crown don't really get close until the very end, right? You can think of, you know, a wall that's really tapered, and you're seating it, seating it, and there's all this room for that cement to kind of leak out. So it's a little easier to seat and get to that minimum th film thickness if you got more tapered kind of walls. So all that being said, most labs have, you know, um, have their process figured out, so they'll do things pretty consistently and kind of... <coughs> one way. They'll have one type of die spacer that they'll use, and then they'll be consistent with the amount of layers that they have um, because it's kind of worked over time. Um, so in our lab, we, uh, Rodney, he's the guy that, or kind of metal guy, will use one layer of uh, die spacer or crowns that we do here. Okay? But I, I just want you to know the general principle of why we need it if it's for, to make room for cement. Okay? Um, so some things about wax, this is more like a board type question. I don't, I'm not going to quiz you on this, but just kind of, if they ask you for the boards uh, we have in the lecture. Type one um, is to use for, um, they used to make it, the wax pan actually in the oral cavity. And type two is generally used for indirect fabrication of castings, which is what essentially we're doing. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so you got to know wax expands when heated, contracts when it's cooled. And then one of the other criteria for wax is we want it to be burned out cleanly. So remember when we take that, uh, invest, you know, after it's been invested, we stick it in the oven. And we heat it up real, real hot. We want that wax, when it burns out, to not leave a lot of residue because that's the same area in which we're going to throw the metal into. So we want it to burn out cleanly is one of the requirements for wax. So what should the wax up look like? Well, if you pay, turn to page 239 in your manual, we got a whole section of how to wax up the, to the teeth. Um, so we can, this is more for your reference. We're not, this is a, uh, we actually won't do this this year, um, go through the whole waxing exercise. But you got a little taste of that your first year. But basically, there's a whole process in which you build the cusp tips first, build those up, and then you build your triangle ridges. Uh, but essentially, it's essentially a dental anatomy class, right? You wax it up so it looks like a tooth. You got to look at the occlusion. You want the contact points in the appropriate areas. Remember we talked about occlusal scheme, custom marginal ridge uh, relationship, right? Some will hit in the central groove. So you got to know your anatomy. And then you got to know your height of contours on your buccal and lingual. You want to sight down and compare it to the decent teeth. And you want to make sure that those uh, contours look like what that tooth used to look like before we had any problems with it, before it needed a crown. Okay. So the idea is that it should look like a tooth, right? A correct, uh, anatomically correct tooth is sort of the idea. 
So that part's pretty easy. Now investment. So once we got this wax pattern kind of waxed up, we're going to take it off of the die. Remember we talked about where if you have an undercut in your preparation, and if it's significant, then this is when your wax pattern may break because you don't have a path of withdrawal. So we know uh, wax is not, in, it's an inelastic material, so it doesn't flex and then return back to its original shape. So it may break if you got an undercut in it. Okay, so let's say you got a great pad with great taper, perfect path of withdrawal. Okay, we can separate it from the die. We need it to end up looking, we need to put this wax pattern into something that looks like this. So there's different parts to it. We saw the video, the bottom part is your crucible former. Um, then you have your sprue, this little uh, blue part that goes vertically up. And then of course your crown. And then we put that in a casting ring. So a couple requirements for this uh, sprue. The sprue must allow for molten wax to escape the mold. The sprue must enable the molten metal to flow into the mold with as little turbulence as possible. So remember that metal that's being slinged in there is really warm and it's going at a high velocity. Okay, um, So you want that <coughs> you need that sprue to be large enough to kind of oh, what did I do? Sorry. Um, you need that to be large enough um, in diameter to allow the, the molten wax to kind of flow in there. So the sprue should be attached to the bulkiest non-critical part of the pattern. So this is generally the non-functional cusp that is used. So a couple reasons, it's pretty bulky, right? So we got a lot of uh, room there. And then it's non-functional because eventually we're gonna have to section the sprue off to get our crown. So if we have our Sprue on the non-functional cusp, it's the least likely to kind of disturb any of the uh, uh, occlusion as we're trying to seat this, right? So imagine if you had the sprue right in the dead center of your central groove. Well, when you go suction that sprue off, you're not sure exactly where you should suction, and it may affect your occlusion, all right? And then the wax pattern should be placed in a minimum of six millimeters, so they want six millimeters from the top. And this is more so because as you sling that metal in, well, it's at high velocity, you don't want the investment part to break. So you've got to have some minimum thickness of that, say about six millimeters. There we go. Okay. So the metal uh, within it must remain molten slightly longer than the alloy that has filled the mold. This provides a reservoir to compensate for the shrinkage that occurs during solidification of the casting alloy. So here's the deal. As you, you know, we have this metal that we've heated up and we're trying to sling it into this little mold. The minute you take it out and then in the process of starting to uh, to spin it, the metal is already cooling, right? So what you want to have happen is you want to have a reservoir. Let me use the mouse here. You want to have a reservoir of molten wax here to, as it slings and as it continues to fill this pattern, that it's still hot enough for it to flow, okay? Sometimes if you don't have this extra channel here, the metal here cools too quickly and it kind of blocks the path for the rest of that metal to fling into the, into the area that you want, okay? So um, let me bring up this textbook here. And we haven't given you a lot of kind of reading assignments. Um, <coughs> so this is one of the classic fixed cross textbook. Uh, by Schillenberg, okay, so chapter 20, and you guys all have vital source, right? You guys all have vital source, right? Yeah. <laughs> you guys opened it this year? No? Okay, well, we're going to make you open it. Schillenberg, chapter 20. The other one's Rosenstiel. Those are great, great resources to learn about anything fixed process. 
So we have this chapter on casting, and let me see if I can find the chapter or part. Okay, so we'll look at the diagrams, and I want you to read this portion on casting. So this talks about the sprueing part. So I just want you to look at the images here, okay? So this is kind of what it looks like, right? With the reservoir. And it shows that molten alloy starts here, and you want that to be able to flow in there. But the minute, you know, we start this process, everything start starting to cool, okay? Um, so that's why we need this extra channel here to allow for uh, sufficient distribution of that metal into the void there. Okay. So once again, if you don't have this, one of the potentials is that the metal here cools too quickly in your sprue, and there's not enough of the molten metal to flow into those spaces. OK, make sense? Question? Yeah, most likely. I mean, so single units, you can probably get away. You know, they show it here with a little reservoir. But single units, you're probably generally okay. Multi-units, of course, there's just more metal. So um, you're more likely to use it for a multi-unit, this little principle of a uh, reservoir. Okay? So I want you to learn just the principle of what that is there for. Okay. So you attach the uh, sprue to a crucible former which is the stuff, uh, the little thing on the bottom, usually a rubber piece right there. And then you have a casting ring, and this can be made up of different materials. And some will have a little liner that goes on the inside of it. So let's go through this. What factors influence the expansion of the investment? So remember, um, investment can expand. So the liner... The idea of the liner is that if you put a little liner in the inside of the casting ring, that liner is compressible. So as your investment sets, it allows for some expansion. So you can alter the amount of expansion by altering the number of liners. Or you can have no liners and just have it set in this rigid kind of metal uh, ring. Okay. So the other factor is you can have it have a ring or have it ringless. <coughs> and what we mean by ringless is that basically you just have a plastic ring that is very flexible and can allow for unrestricted um, expansion. So it's not truly ringless. Just think of it as well, allow, a plastic ring allows for it to expand as much as it wants, whereas a metal ring would kind of confine that expansion. And there's setting, hydroscopic, and thermal expansion. So setting expansion is just as you mix things and it sets, just like gypsum, it can expand, right? So we've talked about that. You know, there's high expansion if we want it to expand more. So just mixing, letting it set, there's some expansion in the material. Hydroscopic is when, as it's setting, you dunk it in some water. So after an hour or so of setting, initial setting, you dunk it in some water. And then as it finishes off that setting reaction, it absorbs all this water and expands even more. And then thermal expansion refers to as a material heats up, things just get bigger. Okay. So liner is compressible, therefore adding <laughs> liners allow for more expansion. Ringless is de designed to allow for unrestricted expansion. So on the right you have the plastic one where you can let the, the investment set. And it'll expand as much as it wants because the, <coughs> the ring is um, plastic and it's flexible. And then this is just um, <coughs> a little slide about the different expansions that we'll see. The graph on the right describes hydroscopic um, um, expansion. So usually this is accomplished by submerging a ring in a water bath for an hour immediately after investment. So if you want extra expansion, just throw it in some water. That's the whole idea. So in our clinic in Alatuki, which is the dental lab we have uh, right next to our school, uh, we don't use a liner. We don't use a ring. We use the plastic kind of ringless type. Uh, so we allow for all uh, kinds of expansion, unrestricted expansion of the investment. And then we don't dunk it in water. So we don't use... so. 
different labs, and this is more historic uh, with the liners and rings. Um, so if you see it, this is more for board prep uh, when you get there, your D4 year, but just so you guys have it here. Okay, so we simplify things. We use a ringless, and then the only types of expansion we get are the setting of the investment, and then obviously when you heat it, it'll get bigger. Okay? So what do we want out of an investment material? Well, it needs to fulfill three requirements. It's got to reproduce the detail of the wax pattern. It's got to be strong enough to withstand not only the heat of the burnout, right, because we've got to heat it up to burn the wax out, but when we sling the metal in, it's got to be strong enough so it doesn't break the investment material. And then it must expand sufficiently to compensate for the solidification um, shrinkage of the alloy. So again, one another variable that we have to control this expansion shrinkage um, to get a casting that fits onto the prepared tooth. So we got to know how they're classified. So there's three ways in which, or it's classified by their binder, is what you got to know. So the binder serves to hold ingredients together and to provide rigidity of this material. So there's three types, gypsum, phosphate, ethyl silicate. And then the refractory is the part that regu regulates the amount of expansion. So that's made out of silica, which is quartz in crystallite. Okay. So the binder, the function of that is to hold things together, provide rigidity. Refractory controls just the amount that, that expands. So silica and quartz, you're going to find that kind of in all three types of investment material. So the silica will always be in gypsum, will always be in phosphate, always be in ethyl silicate. Okay. Because that's the part that controls the expansion. And they differ by what you put in to kind of hold everything together. So let's go through this. Gypsum was classically used, is not used very much kind of at all anymore, because you, it can't be heated above uh, 650 Celsius. So that's sort of the upper limit. Um, it was generally used for gold, high gold containing alloys with melting ranges below 1,000 Celsius. So this is the melting temperature of the alloy. Okay, so that's 1,000. But when you put the investment in the oven, that can go above 650. So if you go above 650, it starts to break down. So then we move to a phosphate bonded, which can be heated above 650, because then we, over time, develop newer alloys. So we'll call those metal ceramic alloys for that for now, that have a higher melting temperature. So since the metals need to be heated higher, right? We wanted the investment to be heated higher so that there's not such a big temperature difference as you sling the metal into the investment. Okay. Just a few of the disadvantages um, were they were rougher and they made more difficult to remove from the investment, uh, more likely to have surface nodules. So these are kind of disadvantages that were classically had. Uh, I think they've done or they've improved the phosphate bonded uh, materials a lot better now where a lot of these kind of disadvantages are minimized. But why use, you know, so most labs have moved to phosphate bonded solely because it can cover any alloy that you want to cast. Whereas if you stuck with gypsum, well, you have to have a separate one for gypsum for the lower melting metals, and then you got to get the phosphate for, you know, the higher melting ones. So it's just... Most lives just simplified and said, you know, let's just use phosphate because there's not much of a disadvantage anymore and can cover all ranges of metals um, that we're going to use. Okay? So most lives you walk into will have phosphate bonded investment material. <coughs> Ethyl silicate we'll just touch upon, um, but it's losing popularity due to its more complicated and consuming procedures. Is if if you do see it, it's going to be used in the construction of high fusing base metal partial denture alloys. So this will be part of your RPD class, um, something you don't have to know from this fixed process class. So when you get into the removable partial dentures, you'll find this material used. Okay? So again, three ways to, uh, to classify investment. You're going to classify it by its binder, and there's three categories. Gypsum, phosphate, ethyl silicate. We use phosphate because it can burn out, it can withstand a higher temperature. So the one we use is called GC Fuji Invest 2. It's a phosphate bonded investment. So here you can read some of the details where they claim, okay, we don't have, we have good 
wettability and all these things that you know, traditionally phosphate bonded materials uh, didn't have great properties for. So they've made improvements in these. So uh, we have less of the surface nodule kind of issues. Okay. So casting, well, that's a process of burning off the wax and filling the space with metal. So let's talk about the metals that we use in the casting procedure. So how are metals classified? Classified by their noble metal content. So what's so significant about noble metals? So many? They're inert, okay. They don't corrode. They don't corrode. So they're stable. Remember noble gases, right? They're stable. So they don't corrode. They're inert. Right? So we want things, we don't want metal to corrode in somebody's mouth. Right? Okay, so they're going to be classified by their <coughs> amount of noble metal content. So here we have the top line. These are our noble metals that are listed. We'll have a slide about that. And then we want over 40% of it needs to be pure gold. And 60% of the weight needs to be some combination of these noble metals. If you meet those two requirements, you have a high noble metal. If you have 25% by weight of noble metal elements, then we consider that a noble metal. Okay. And then if you have less than that, we're going to call it a predominantly or a base metal, is what we classify. So here's a simple way to think about it. So high noble needs to be 60% noble metal. And out of that, 40% of it needs to be gold. And then noble metal is above 25% noble and base is less than. Okay? So classically, if you look in the textbooks, and you may need to know this for boards, but they used to classify the gold alloys based on strength. So there's type 1 through 4, where type 4 is the strongest. Um, it talks about the minimal minimum yield strength of material. So let's talk about yield strength. Remember this elastic plastic deformation, right? So in the elastic region, if you stress that material, it's going to move a certain distance. That's delta x. That's your strain. And then the minute you unstress it, as long as you're in this plastic region, it's going to return back to its original shape. So this is describing a material that is perfectly elastic. It always return back. If you stress it to this dot, that point right there, then it turns into a plastic region, meaning if you go beyond that, then the material is going to have some sort of permanent deformation. Or another way to say it, it's going to have some sort of plastic deformation. So elastic strain, deformation that is uh, recovered, so you can fully recover it. Plastic strain is something that will deform. So the, so the slope of this, the rise of the, over the run, this is what we call <coughs> the, mod, the elastic modulus, or the modulus of elasticity. So it's a ratio, and it gives us an idea of how, um, when we talked about metal versus plastic fork. Okay? So this is what this describes, modulus of elasticity. So yield point, this is the point in which it turns from elastic to plastic. So in the previous chart, we said a 0.2% yield strength. What this describes, so it's really hard to measure exactly the point in which something turns from elastic to plastic. So they pick a percent of deformation that they can actually physically measure. And that becomes a little bit more meaningful for us. So they stress this material until they measure 0.2% of plastic deformation. And that becomes our yield strength. So a lot of times you'll see it in a 0.2% yield strength or just yield strength. The stress at which a, specific, a test specimen exhibits a specific amount of plastic strength. I know, fascinating stuff. It's probably the worst lecture to give this. <laughs> it's all dental materials. All right, so we got metals, OK? Again, high noble, noble base metal. Have to know how they're classified. These are classic, classic board questions. So these are our, um, this chart calls it precious metals. 
The only one that in dentistry we don't consider a normal metal is AG. And what's AG for you? Silver, right? Okay. So ruthium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, platinum, gold. Okay. So remember this chart? Who's our chemistry majors? Aren't the three girls in the back all chemistry majors? Okay. What is this chart of? This is our reduction potential, right? So how do we understand this chart? The likelihood of picking up electrons, right? <coughs> So if you have a high reduction potential, that means this gold is likely to get these three electrons, and then we're going to have gold in its kind of solid state, right? So you can notice all the ones in bold. Most of the ones in bold are our um, noble metals. So this just describes the fact that our noble metals are stable, okay? Because they're likely to pick up these electrons, be stable over time. They're not easily corroded. So that's an advantage of using a high or a noble or high noble metal, right? So the greater the uh, noble metal content, the better because the less it'll corrode. So what's one of the disadvantages of a high noble metal and why have we kind of slowly moved away from it? Because they're expensive. They're extremely expensive now compared to where they once were. So we found other metals that we can use to kind of... Um, so we don't have to pay as much, basically. Okay. So here's just some examples of different formulations that you know people have come up with. So in this category, we have gold, silver, and platinum. And these are the percentages. So you want to look at the ones by weight. So this one, 11% silver. This is mostly gold, 78%. So we're going to consider that a high noble metal, right? So if we gave you a metal, and then we gave you its composition, what we need you to be able to do is figure out what category of metal that's in. Question? So silver, you would not. Silver, we won't consider a noble metal. Correct. Yeah, it's got to be the other seven, which are listed down. Oh, this one has silver. Um, so silver classically has not been considered. Let's put it that way. I think you will find some textbooks that include it. but. Um, so just, just for the purpose of this course, we won't count silver as a noble metal. Okay. So again, just another chart. So these are some of the base metals that you'll typically see. Nickel, beryllium, titanium, aluminum, chromium. Cobalt is another one. Copper. So those are some of the other base metals that you'll kind of see. So remember, the classifications is based on noble metal content. And just more examples of different, differing compositions. So uh, one of the exercises, let's get to it right now. So these are the ones that we'll use for metal ceramic. So the metal that we're going to use when we want to stack porcelain on top. There's two types that we use. Argibon 80 and Argident Euro. And for our full gold crowns, we have one that's called Argenco 56 and Argenco Y+. So let's do this as an exercise. Um, let's have this quarter of the room. You guys look up Argibon 80. The back, you guys look up Argident Euro. You guys here are 56. And then the back, you guys are Y. So look up what composition or how would you classify these metal? So where do you do that, right? Where's the first place you'd start? Just copy and paste that and hit Google. So by the time you get into clinic and you guys pull up a lab sheet and you stare at these, even if you don't know what it is, you know how to look it up, okay? So I don't want to be answering any questions about, I don't know what this is. Okay, what would you have, Josh? You guys are Euro. High Noble. How would you know it's High Noble? Okay. Yeah, let's, let's go through the composition. But more than... Okay. Right. So you have 40% gold, 39% palladium. Those are two noble metals. So we're at 80% almost of noble metal, of which 40%, you've hit that 40% criteria of gold. Okay. So the euro is a high noble metal. Who else found a hit? 
Okay, what did you guys get? 56. So for a full metal, shouldn't say gold, but full metal crowns, what type of metal is that? It's a noble metal. And how did you come to that conclusion? Almost 56% gold. Okay. The rest of it is noble metal. It's not noble metals. Okay. Because you have palladium, which is at 4%. Okay. Silver. Silver. Okay. All right, what did you guys get? Y plus is 2% gold, making it 35% palladium and 30% silver. The most economical yellow alloy available today. Okay. What classification would you classify that in? Um, so does it fulfill our criteria for high noble? Oh, no. So what's our... So what does something need to be for it to be a high noble metal? 60% by weight for total no gold metal, and 40% of it needs to be gold. Okay. So we don't have enough gold in there for it to be high noble, right? But does it classify as a noble metal? What does yeah. it say? It says noble metal, right? Okay. How about the 80? What do we get for 80? Noble metal, right? Okay. So the point is you got to know what, how to classify them, and if we gave you a list of what each thing is made up of, you'll be able to find out... Uh, what nobility that is. Yeah, question. So if something is like 59.89%. Yeah, like the one that you guys looked at? Yeah. yeah. What, right. So I think they round up, or there, there's other elements in there that they probably haven't listed. percent palladium and 56% gold. Because I think they do consider that a high noble, the one that you guys looked at. Because that's, you got 55.8 plus the 4.11, and then um, there's got to be something else in there that bumps it up to. Yeah, yeah, so it's 59.94, so I think they count it, just like your grades, right? You kind of round up. Oh, not no more, huh? All right, not bad, not bad. All right, well, we're going to do it for noble metals, high noble metals. If you're at 59.94, we're going to count that as 60%, thus making the Y plus, you guys have the Y plus, right? Classify as a high noble metal. 50, no, 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 here it says 59. No, 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 oh, sorry, sorry. So the total composition is 59% uh, noble metal, or um, yeah, which gets us over the 60%. That's part of the criteria for it to be a high noble. Okay. Does that make sense? We had the 56. Oh, okay. 56. I got you. All right. So change that in your notes if you guys have wrote it down incorrectly. Our Jenko 56 is actually a high noble metal. And the Y plus is your noble metal. Okay, so this is what you got to know about castability. So as you go from high noble, one of the benefits of high noble is that one is corrosion, but it has a better castability, meaning when you sling it, it's going to fill that void a little easier than a base metal. So you can kind of see the comparison of, so these are some tests that they ran. Okay, castability. So they have this little mesh netting, and how well does that metal kind of get to all the little nooks and crannies. So high noble metals are, have better castability. Another test they did is they just made castings you know, off of standard dies, and they see how well the margins fit. So your Jelenko O, this is a high noble metal, the one on the very left. And that had the least marginal discrepancy, whereas if you use more base metals, you're going to have um, a little bit more discrepancy. So, higher the nobility, nobility, the better. But of course, anything that's better costs more. So, how do you cut through a porcelain fused metal crown? Well, you're going to use a. So, if you ever need to take off a crown because it's got, because it has recurrent carries underneath it, you got to use a diamond burr to cut through the porcelain, and a carbide burr to cut through the metal. So, you'll know immediately when you get to a base metal because you're going to blow through tons and tons of these carbide burrs because the base metal is a very hard metal to cut through. Whereas if you think about it, gold, right? You know, in the Olympics, they bite into their gold metal. Gold is softer, so maybe that's one way to remember it. So if you have a high noble metal, 
It's mainly um, made of gold. It's going to be softer. It's going to be easier to cut through. Whereas if you get to a base metal, you're going to need a bunch of these carbide burrs to eventually cut off that crap. That's more of a practical kind of thing. <coughs> How does the ability affect melting temperature? So the higher, uh, so your base metals have higher melting temperatures compared to your high noble. Just think of gold. You don't need to heat gold as much to melt it. Okay? Shrinkage. Base metals shrink more. Therefore, we should use what type of gypsum? Type Type 5. And how would we describe type 5 gypsum? What are the words we attach to that? High strength, something expansion. High expansion, right? Okay. You got to know that. Castability, high noble metals are, have better castability. Hardness, we talked about that. You need more carbide burrs to cut off a base metal. And then corrosion, your high noble metals are less corrosive. Okay, just a chart describing some of this stuff. So if you <coughs> look at high noble alloy, it's excellent biocompatibility. It's minimal in terms of technique sensitivity. It's easy to bond porcelain to, uh, but the metal cost is very high. So this is just for your own kind of um, reference. Um, <clears throat> I'll let you know if I'll test you on one of these. I probably won't. But these are just common casting errors um, or problems that you'll encounter with casting that is found in your textbook. Okay. So this is more for your reference. Uh, since we don't teach you guys how to cast here. You guys actually don't get to do it, um, but just for your knowledge. Okay, let's go through some of the materials we actually use. So, Aquasil, this is the working and setting time uh, for impression. You got to know that PVS shrinks and it's hydrophobic. Okay, so it's not water loving. That's why fluid control is so key in getting a good impression. You got a minute, 10 seconds to get the material into the mouth from the time that it starts mixing. Also, from the time that it starts mixing, you have five minutes until you can pull it out of the mouth. Okay. So step three, where we mount, we use a type four gypsum for our stone. For our mounting plaster, that's a type one. Remember how stone or gypsum is classified by? One through five, it's based on what property? Their compressive strength, right? And then the difference between type four and five is they have the same strength. One is higher expansion. Okay, then we use a phosphate bonded material. And then this is our binder. So what are the other two that we've mentioned? Gypsum and ethyl silicate. Gypsum doesn't can't withstand higher temperatures. They can't withstand anything over 650 degrees. So we don't use it as much. But classically, it was used with high gold-containing alloys because they melt at a lower temperature. And ethyl silicate, you're going to use for your base metals that are used to make partial, removable partial denture frameworks uh, for your partially edentulous patients. And then the other part, so that's a binder, the part that causes expansion is, the part that causes expansion is, quartz, crystal, crystallite, right, or silica, <coughs> they all describe the same thing. So that stuff will be in all uh, investment materials. But the way you classify them or differentiate them is based on their binder. And their binder distinguishes what uh, temperature they can withstand. Okay, our metals. We have two that we use now uh, in our lab here for 
the metals that we want to stack porcelain to. That's Argibon 80 and Euro. Euro is the high noble. The full gold, or that should be full metal crowns. The 56 is our high noble metal. Right, AJ? Did I get that right? Okay. And the Y plus is a noble metal. So you'll see that we don't use uh, base metals in our lab here. The ones that we're going to cast for you in our class are going to be base metals because they're cheaper and they don't go in somebody's mouth. Okay, so we got different viscosities for impression material. We got an extra light, these probably what? Viscosity. We have a light viscosity, a medium, and a heavy. Type 1 through 5 gypsum, classified <coughs> by strength. So, what's microstone? What type is that? Type 3, right? And why do we use type 3 for our denture cases? Because it's easier to break, because we've got to break it, this master cast, in order to recover the denture. And type 4 and 5 are... So when you guys get your casts, when we actually do this project, you can take an instrument and just try to scratch your microstone, and then pick up the die stone and try to scratch that. And we'll kind of notice that one's a lot harder. Okay. Three, uh, three ways to classify gypsum, phosphate, ethyl silicate, quartz or crystallite or silica are your things that cause <laughs> expansion. Got to know high noble, noble, and base. Those are classified by nobility. You got to have over 40% gold for your high noble. And then 25% is sort of the cutoff between noble and base.